and uh, I feel like I was born an artist. Um, when I was uh, 14, the Alberta College of Art and Design offered glass blowing for the first time to people under the age of 18. Um, and I was very curious about it, so I decided to uh, take that course. And as a result, I decided to become a glass blower. Um, so I was in a happy uh, bubble of art immersion. Um, and I feel like art school both accelerates and disrupts your art making process. And so I'd recommend it, but I also wouldn't necessarily want to do it again. <laughs> Um, so that's a picture of me working in the hot shop, which is what we call the uh, glass blowing studio. Uh, this is an early project that I still like. So early on, I was drawn to nature themes. Um, this is a casting project I did where I looked up the animal that I was depicting and I found out a lot of interesting stuff about it. So nautiluses are a type of cephalopod. They're related to octopus, cuttlefish, and squid. Uh, I thought they would only have eight tentacles, but they can actually have up to 90. And they haven't changed much in 500 million years, so they're evolutionarily right where they want to be. Um, so when I was in art school, I went through a documentary phase where I'd watch about 10 one-hour documentaries per week. Um, and it was based on the schedule rather than content. And so I saw a lot of episodes that I wouldn't necessarily have picked for myself to watch. Um, and as a result of seeing so many documentaries, I started to see connections in a lot of things. So this is the type of information that I was assembling when I was thinking about art projects. Um, it's a food web representation. So what you see is um, orca at the top. It eats pollock, stellar sea lions, and salmon. Um, and all of them eat herring. So in the 1910s, too many orcas were killed. Uh, so there were fewer orcas eating pollock. Uh, so there were more pollock uh, eating herring. Um, and in the 80s, uh, humans decided to protect the pollock stock. And um, so stellar sea lions can eat uh, more than twice their body weight in pollock. And because pollock doesn't have the nutrients they need, they'll still starve to death. And so that was what started happening with stellar sea lions. And so it's sort of about like a history of interactions, what you expect versus what is you actually observe happening. Um, and this is the kind of mistake that we make when we don't have uh, science giving us the info that we need. Um, so a lot of my time in art school was spent sort of unsuccessfully trying to translate this kind of information into a sculpture. Um, so this one, uh, at the time, every turtle dissected in the last 10 years had plastic in its stomach. Uh, and that's because turtles think plastic bags are jellyfish and they try to eat them. So now it's about 10 years later, so it's been 20 years of plastic in turtles' stomachs. The uh, Oceanographic Museum of Monaco released into the Mediterranean a toxic algae developed to keep aquariums clean. Uh, they never admitted to the spill or cleaned it up. Uh, this type of algae creates an environment where nothing can survive, so it's like cleaning the uh, water. An urchin usually takes about a minute to right itself when you place it upside down. However, in the water with this toxic algae, it takes about 30 minutes. Um, this was sort of an attempt at having a more nuanced look at the effects of human interactions with the sea, so linking everyday life with sea life, um, and sort of seeing everything is connected, uh, and that we need to contextualize our daily lives within what the natural system can bear. Uh, so when I was in my last year of art school, I saw Blue Planet by David Attenborough, and particularly episode three was really inspirational to me. Um, it was about deep sea, very deep sea creatures, and it was very visually inspiring, and it showed that alien scenes uh, were present on Earth and that new discoveries were possible. So this shows a hydrothermal vent uh, system. They were discovered in 1977, and they were a complete shock to what people thought they knew about the necessities for life on Earth. So there's no sunlight, and there's no photosynthesis. And a new creature was discovered every 10 days in these uh, ecosystems for many years, and there's still an area of great discovery. So this was my grad piece in 2008, and it was about imaginary sea creatures that could be discovered um, based on this hydrothermal vent system. So this was my first project with sort of more possibility for hope of preservation rather than being about one negative fact. Um, and my art making process was upended in a way that a lot of art pieces were sort of trying to be more like essays than like self-expression. Um, and the problem with that is that the essay slash art piece just has one specific interpretation and message, and so it's very closed conceptually. Um, the ideas of an essay just, they don't really translate into a sculpture because you can't make all the you know, points that you sort of need to make. Um, but the common elements of my work at that time was multiples, minimalism, and monotone. 
So I took a year off, uh, and then I got a job working on Grenfell Island in the hot shop here. And I had kind of felt an ideas block, and I thought access to the hot shop would end that ideas block. Um, but I started a sort of unproductive period where I was sort of focused on miniaturizing existing projects. Um, I did feel like I created some interesting imagery, but I was generally struggling to find my voice as an artist without really knowing what exactly I was struggling with. Um, so I feel like I did have some success in rethinking past projects um, and trying to consider a general audience, general public audience rather than just the uh, art school audience. Um, and in 2013, my parents gave me the gift of going to take a three-week immersive course at Pilchuck, which is a glass school in Washington State. So everyone there is an artist, um, everyone there is making something, so there's always a lot of stimulation and people to talk to about any kind of um, artistic thing you might think of. Um, and the work that I made there, I was still floundering and I was still sort of um, working in the sea theme, which by that point I kind of felt restricted by uh, sea theme. But I wasn't really sure of how to change that. And so I was just sort of starting to look at shapes rather than thinking about concepts. And I realized that access to the hot shop wasn't the end of uh, the art school hangover. So after a period, um, after going to Pilchuck, I realized that I'm an artist who blows glass and not just a glass blower. And what that means is that I can pursue anything as an artist, like any concept, any material. Um, and so I started a more productive period. Um, coming up with new ideas takes work. There's a myth that artists are just inspired by a god or that we dream our ideas, but it actually takes focused energy and practice. Um, and so I was starting to feel the benefits of, of trying to focus my energy. So these are strange future seed pods, and I'm playing with scale and thinking about the effects of a warmer planet. Um, I have a friend named Sarah who brought me into the ceramic studio with her, and that was when I started sort of intentionally using mixed media and thinking about how to incorporate other materials. And that was also sort of helped me transition into uh, working with a land-based theme. Um, so this piece is the first piece that's sort of more focused on an intention to address the strangeness of past and future plants. And I feel like these three works, um, Subterranean Passengers and Recurrence, uh, are my breakthrough into my adult voice as an artist. So I feel like these pieces are more conceptually open. Um, they encourage interpretation, uh, narrative creation, and curiosity. And they're no longer sort of one-liner facts like the work that I was making in art school. Um, I was still interested in sea creatures, and in 2012, I went to Red Deer College to TA a course with Jeff Holmwood, um, and so this was some marine work that I made there. Uh, this is another early ceramic combination, so again, it's sort of working with the strange seed pod ideas and creating an imaginary world. Uh, this is the last all glass design that I did, and it was trying to sort of connect again with the plant theme. Um, and I was surprised in uh, researching the prickly pear cactus as to how far north it can go into the Rockies. And so even though cactus is very recognizable, um, this was the start of thinking about uh, the strange possibilities of plants that are already existing. Uh, so this is a tulip-shaped sea creature fossil that was found in Alberta. Um, at this point, I had stopped watching so many documentaries and my research was sort of more incidental. Um, and this particular discovery influenced my ideas about what belongs on land versus what belongs on the sea in terms of shapes. Um, so you can see like plants are already making a lot of very strange shapes currently. Um, and so I was sort of looking closer and dealing with scale and starting to think about imaginary future evolution, although I didn't have that phrase yet. Uh, so common elements of nature are multiples, minimalism in terms of efficiency, um, specific use of color, which is not necessarily directed at the human eye. Uh, nature self-organizes, it's impartial, it's full of strange shapes and functions, and it's very susceptible to interference. So this is marimo, it's a type of algae that grows off the coast of Scotland, Estonia, Japan, and Iceland. And it only exists where the seabed allows it to roll constantly to maintain a spherical shape. Uh, so in 2014, I took an administration job at IE Creative, which is a public art company on Granville Island, uh, and they design and fabricate their public art pieces. So I feel like these are artists who really dig deeper. They really analyze what is happening and why and what is possible. Um, and I feel like they truly understand the value of their community. So um, 
As a result of being there, I was able to uh, work with Cheryl to make the metal base for this piece. Um, and I also started meeting other artists on Granville Island, so I met a jeweler who helped me make this piece. Um, I met JC, the carpenter, who helped me make the uh, base for this piece. And working with people who are experts in other materials encouraged me, me to be more experimental on my own. Um, and I felt very curious and very open to try new things. Uh, so this is my first work with concrete. I also started to get into fungus and go on BC nature walks. Um, and I'd previously seen fungus as a negative sign of rot, but I developed a new appreciation when I learned that many plants will not grow without their fungus partners. So this piece is lichen inspired and I'm picturing it being very fast growing in a hot future and getting very large. Um, and it's also sort of about existing relationships changing together. Uh, this piece includes found object metal and it's about reclamation in the future. Um, organisms can evolve to eat anything alongside available materials and extremophiles are an example of microbes that can live on acid. Uh, so there is a potential for metal eaters and plastic eaters in the future. So my time uh, in the Granville Island Hot Shop ended and I started working at Terminal City Glass Co-op. It's a community hub owned by members and there I was able to find consistent glass blowing partnership with Hope Forstenzer. Um, I had kind of struggled to find consistent partnership on uh, Granville Island in terms of fabrication assistance, not in terms of like art concept development. And finding someone to work with really increased what was possible for me. Uh, so the large glass piece is made at the co-op at one of their large uh, piece team nights. And the small purple piece was made with Cheryl from IE Creative. And this piece is thinking about unrecognizable flowers and their pods. Uh, so flowering plants only developed 160 million years ago and they're now the most diverse uh, plant type. And I consider this to be sort of my second breakthrough piece. Um, it's the first piece where I'm really using ceramic and glass as two equal materials rather than uh, the glass element always coming first. Um, they're, they're two materials with significantly different working styles. Um, and when I was working with Sarah, who bring, was bringing me to her uh, ceramic studios, um, I was working in white clay. But once I found my own co-op studio, I started to work almost exclusively with the black clay. And I started to feel like the possibilities with the black clay were as expansive as with uh, glass. Uh, so this is a very large piece. It uh, just barely fit in the kiln to be fired. Um, and it's the first piece to just be clay. And it was part of deciding that a work could just be finished when it felt finished without a requirement to use any particular materials. Um, and so again, it's sort of a seed pod idea. Um, this piece is sort of about uh, repeating life cycles. Um, so I, I, my job at IE Creative ended, but um, I'm still very happy to visit, and I, I remember it very fondly. Uh, this is the first wall piece that I made since I was in art school, and again, it's sort of very large, um, hot future versions of fungus on a tree. Um, this piece is about seeing all parts of nature as necessary. So for example, after a fire, a new jack pine generation will begin a new forest. Um, this piece I picture being between water and land worlds, submerged like a lily pad. And I'm sort of moving into wanting to create pieces that could go on land or in the sea. Um, this would be something that grows in a very like hot, wet, tropical climate. Uh, so I started to have a desire to create a more in immersive environment uh, rather than just having pieces on plinths. Um, and I had a new interest in placing humans in the imaginary future world. I feel that we can be part of the future if we choose to be and if we choose to work with nature instead of against it. Um, the more you learn, the more you realize that you don't know. And that has to be remembered when we're making decisions about the environment. So if you recall that slide I showed earlier of the sea life food web depending on herring and getting the wrong interference from people. Uh, so this is a wall piece and I'm still thinking about seed pods and wanting to incorporate all parts of the gallery to create that immersive experience. Um, in 2015, I was awarded a Van City Commission, and this is located on uh, 4th and Vine in the Van City there. Um, and I'd seen the application for the branch near my house a year earlier, but I had felt like it was too overwhelming to apply. Um, but as a result of my time at IE Creative, I felt influenced to apply um, and it's not that what they do is easy, but it's that they decide to do things and that leads to their accomplishments. And so it's like you just have to start and keep at it. 
Um, and I'm also grateful to Hope Forstenzer, my glassblowing partner, and Shalimar Lakowski, my ceramic studio manager, um, both of whom gave endless support and were necessary for the completion of this commission. Um, this project really drove home the fact that success is in the kind of community you're able to build around yourself. Uh, so I started to get interested in bioluminescence. Um, this piece is in the exhibition. We weren't quite able to get it dark enough, but they are, uh, they are illuminated. Do I take questions? <laughs> um, I worked on Grandfall Island between uh, 2009 and 2015. Okay. Um, it's the only one that's here. It's Nismal and Sterling. Of the which, um, um, those ones I did myself. Uh, the one that, that uh, the argon gas filled one. Um, I took a class at uh, Terminal City Glass Co-op and that was neon in the hot shop. So it was making a blown piece. Um, usually neon just sort of goes in tubing uh, to make like words, for example, or to make like a line drawn image. Um, and so in this case, uh, there's the, the teacher was able to find a process to um, pump uh, ga various types of noble gases into blown pieces, um, s sort of as part of the blowing process um, to be able to get that effect. Yeah. You had a question? Yes. Watching the fact that you are now involved in glass and clay, and it looked like maybe some textile. Yes. If somebody said to you, you have to choose one of these, can you imagine? Um, I think that I probably would still go back to glass um, just because it is a very challenging medium um, and a joke that we had in art school I took a four-year bachelor's degree with a major in glass blowing and the joke that we had was it takes five years to be good um, but what I'm finding is actually it takes 10 years to be good. <laughs> and so I feel like I've, I've put so much time specifically into glass that that one would be the hardest one to give up. But it would definitely be a challenge to um, just, you know, because so much more is possible once you can use any material um, that it's kind of like coming out of a cave and then having to just go back into it. <laughs> yeah.